lot of work with mental health and abuse and family intervention type stuff. Um, I like, um, it's, it's hard to describe what you do because it's different, but I really like it and it's really effective. And I was thinking as we're thinking about poverty and now coming to the end of our time together, we need to look at some solutions and things that can work. And we know that addictions and mental health are significant players in the poverty world. Whether you're working with uh, Aboriginal families or single moms or wherever you are. And uh, Mona worked at the Pathways program. And do you still do that? Mm -hmm. And uh, those, those clients are probably the most severe uh, with addictions and mental illness of anybody in our system. So uh, we know that this uh, cool solutions works. And uh, I think what I like about it is the resiliency pieces and the family solutions and all of those kinds of things. So I asked Mona to come and to uh, take you on a journey for the next hour through uh, her work and what she does. And uh, put this one into your cap and take it with you. Because when you're out there, whether you're in a church or in a social service environment, this will be something that you can use. And I'm quite convinced that uh, many of you can use it as you move on and beyond in Ambrose. So Mo Mona, thank you for coming. Welcome. And looking forward to hearing you. Mom, you don't listen. And by the way, quit telling me what to do and help me problem solve. This was my daughter. She was 22 years old. She was going through the third year university of nursing. And it was that year that she had a near-death experience and ended up in a manic state. To the point of, I have the cure for AIDS. That was very scary as a family to hear those words. And previous to that, some things were happening, but we didn't recognize that it was happening or things were in their process. And what was happening was, when she had this near-death experience, and I won't go into detail because I want to make sure I stay in the timeline. If you have questions, you can ask me after. The thing is, what happened was she had that near-death experience. She came home from it. And she told her dad and I, her dad and myself, that you, that she was having difficulty and that she felt like she was going to die on the mountain. And when after that, that was the beginning of the escalation of her manic state of bipolar depre uh, depression. And what happened was that she, what she was doing, she was rollerblading around the Glenmore Reservoir twice a day. She was maybe sleeping four hours. Plus, there was pacing around the house. She wouldn't sit down with us at dinner time. And then as time went on on that night, where she said, I have the cure for AIDS. I want you to come with me. Well, we had a hard time believing this. Consequently, we were going to take her to the hospital. And before we could start to take her to the car, she bolted out the door. Her siblings went after her, and we had to haul her to the hospital. Her name is Candace Watson. She speaks publicly, and also through CMHA, they've written a book with a lot of individual stories to break down the sick to death of the silence. And she's one of the speakers and one of the profiles, and this is my daughter. She's now. 42, mom of three, has the same husband, has a nursing career, and also she sits on the Canadian Mental Health Association board. So that whole process of when she started out and where she is today has been a journey of 19 years. And at that time, our family had no clue what to do. And there were no resources to help the family. So I'm going to take you on a journey today that gives you an understanding of what happens through a process 
of what the individual goes through and what the family goes through and the definite you know techniques that we're using now to help families and how to monitor and, and show where their strengths are and this is the process that I'm going to take you through this is the objective of the whole uh, presentation is understanding the impact of the family on the recovery process and learning how families can skillfully manage their lives despite mental illness and then the resiliency questionnaire to monitor family wellness and program program efficacy this is a stat one in five people in Canada experience a mental health problem and affects most everyone and as you can see the cost is 50 billion per year and cost to businesses is six billion well, the cost to a family if they don't get the help is lost relationships, broken down families, and an individual that may not end up with the support that they truly need in order to be well. This is the house that we have. And this, how this started was our, my daughter and I, quite a few years ago when she was starting to speak, we developed this whole process. And we put it in the form of a house, and it's a home. So as you can see, there's different steps to it. And along the way, we have the foundation where we have the early symptoms. And then we have what the major crisis is, the first hospitalization. And then when the individual gets the help and then the interventions that are needed to help them, if you don't do this side, the house will not stay standing, it'll collapse. This was a piece, and still is today, but it's getting better. The family is the missing piece to the individual getting well. Well, we raised her, and when things go well, wrong, where does she go? Home to family. However, if the family don't get what they need to help them to support her in a, while, in a way, as I said earlier when I started out, she told me, Mom, you don't listen. I was a fixer and darn good at it until it didn't work. The other part was I was telling her what to do rather than having her part of the process to find solutions. So this piece came in and this is the piece that we brought in but we had to learn what to do. This is what our company Cool Family Solutions does. It puts the roof on the house. If you don't have the roof on the house well, rain, snow, sleep, sunshine all comes in, and you're not protected. So this way, we're showing you a process of what happens. I'm going to start out with the house with the early symptoms. Pacing for hours. And as I said, she was rollerblading and running around the reservoir two times a day. Phoning everyone she knew, and we knew. I didn't know we knew as many people as we did by the time she got done phoning. There were so many. But she had the cure for AIDS. And everything that she felt she needed to do and she wanted to convince people to come with her. We didn't know some of these calls. We didn't have a clue. And then she started laughing uncontrollably. Huh, I just broke off my boyfriend. Sure, good thing I did that. And she just the whole personality started to change of who she was. And as I said, maybe sleeping four hours per day. The major crisis, she had the cure for AIDS, up dancing all night. She figured she had solved all the world's problems and bolting out the door and hauling her down and she bit her sister. This evening was one of the toughest as a mom have ever gone through. And watching my daughter out of control and not knowing who she was or what she was doing even though she felt that. It was an experience that changed our lives. And I have to tell you, it's not all hopeless. It's very hopeful. Because there was a gift in this whole process. And the gift was, well, her and I are a lot alike. We were in battles half the time. And her dad was trying to 
keep peace between the two of us. Well, we eventually had to figure out things together. And now we have a relationship that's extremely strong. And she's doing very well. And where she was grateful was that lots of times individuals living with mental illness or addictions, it's always their problem. They're the problem. If we can fix them, then everything should be okay. Well, that wasn't the case. If we had not have done what we did to help ourselves and figure out what we needed to change amongst ourselves, I wouldn't be sitting, standing here today telling you our story. Individual problems. She did not believe she had the illness. One episode, come on. There is no, should be an issue. Stopped eating. Well, what happened was, these were started the pieces that we started to learn how to help her. She quit eating in the hospital. It was poison, the food was poison. And we couldn't convince her. Just remember, we had to haul her to the hospital and she didn't trust us at all as a family. So we went to the nurse that was there and we said, she won't eat because she feels the food is poison. Can you help us out? So the nurse says to Candace, she says, you know Candace, when the food comes up, if you lift the lid and it's hot, nobody's tampered. But if you lift the lid and it's cold, don't eat it. Well, we all know that the food is hot when you lift the lid. That was the end of it. She started to eat. And these were the pieces that we started to learn how to work with the logical side of her brain. Helping her think it through or that process. And just listening to that made a huge difference. Another incident was I went to the hospital to visit her and she had a whole big bag and it had bedding in it. And she showed me the bedding and she said, it's evidence. She just felt like there was poison and everything else so she had all the sheets and she wanted to keep it as evidence that there was. So consequently, she said to me, mom, you take that bag home and don't touch it or anything, you just keep it, it's evidence. I looked at her, had to pause for a minute, and I said, hmm, there's a problem. And she's, well, what's the problem? I says, the problem is, you know, that's, uh, that's a hospital's property. If I go out, almost like Santa Claus, with the bag behind me, going out from the desk, they're gonna say, what are you doing with our property? And that could be stealing. And I says, that could be a problem for your mother. All right, she shoved it in. She says, I don't want anything to happen to you and she gave it up. But you see, I didn't argue with her. What her thinking was, was her thinking. I could not change it. But if I could help bring that logical piece to her, it made a huge difference. And I wasn't arguing with her and causing the conflict. So lots of times at disillusionment, her mind failed her. This is very frustrating to her. And the paranoia, of course, she couldn't tell what was real. for her was medication, a psychiatrist, voluntarily admitted eventually she did, because there was many episodes, eight, nine, ten, I can't keep count, there was quite a few, but she eventually she started putting herself in the hospital because she knew that's where the help was and she went to that and the reality of her situation started to hit her. Here's the first objective that I mentioned, was the impact on the family during the recovery process. Family problems. Through this whole process, it was a question. I don't know, I, I was very naive. I did not know what mental illness was. I did not know what bipolar disorder was. I didn't know any of these things, so I had to learn. And she was a nurse. She understood what it was all about. So she was much more knowledgeable than the family. But she didn't believe that she had that. Fears, fears of her future. 
and our family. We did not know. With my husband, he was working in northern Alberta at the time, and when we had her in the hospital, put her in the hospital that night, and the next day he left for northern Alberta. It was very upsetting for him, and here's what he said to me. Don't forget about her. That goes back many, many years ago where you just shoved them in an institution and shut the door. And when he said that, that was a scary thought to me, to even think of that. The emotions, the anger, the sadness, the guilt, resentment, lots of times she was mad. She blamed me for her problems. And we had many anger situ situations. And then the triggers. There was many times she knew my button. She knew how to push it. And when she did, of course, I would react. And that's what I had to learn to do, is how to respond. And then conflict. Lots of times telling her what to do and not listening. Here's a quote. And it basically indicates how important family is to the whole process. Family participation is also an asset of the treatment process and an invaluable information because of the uh, assessment and aftercare. We as a family know her the best. We knew the information, we knew what she was about, and so into what we could do is offer to the healthcare system little things about her and what she was about and maybe some things that would help them. Continuation of that is, in addition, is the family participation, it has been researched to say, decreased psychotic symptoms, recurrent hospitalizations, burden of care, as well as overall cost of treatment. As time went on, what happened was that we got into a position that we had the skills, communication, boundaries, self-care, all of these different things that we needed to do. And when we learned to do these type of things, it made a huge difference of how to support our daughter and for us to stay well. So that cost, what happened is that eventually she could stay at home. She could be with her children. And her psychiatrist would work with us. And our family and her husband's in-laws got to support her as well. So it made a huge difference when we were all teaming together to make that huge difference overall and that support system to stay in place. Is there any questions so far at this point? Because I'm going to have more question sessions at the point, but if there's any questions, are there any questions? So learning how families can skillfully get their lives back despite mental illness. Here's understanding what the family process is. As you can see, sought help. When our daughter was diagnosed, as I mentioned, we took her to the hospital and we were told to call Canadian Mental Health Association by a professor at the U of C. And she told us to call and talk to Paya Elliott. And this was an individual that had bipolar disorder herself, plus her children. When I phoned her that next day, that was the thing that changed our lives right there. She said something to me that I've not forgotten, and each of us can remember this because it makes a huge difference, regardless of whether you're dealing with these things or not. Self-care. She says, take care of yourself. I says, lady, you've got a problem. I could not take care of myself with all this chaos going on. But that was the word she needed to say to me. And taking care of myself was maybe just taking 15 minutes in a day and regrouping. She educated us what mental illness was, what things we could do, what skills we could have to help us. This gave us a feeling of safe and open and sharing we were starting to open share, and what she did is she took us under her wing. She talked to myself, my husband, individually, and then she also talked to Candace's siblings and her boyfriend. Oh, and by the way, he married her. Bless his heart. Honest feedback. It's giving honest feedback. 
And that part of that, I facilitate family peer support for Canadian Mental Health Associations. And one of the things I've learned, and John mentioned that I'm also with Pathways to Housing, and that's working with individuals with mental illness and or addictions. And this is the one thing they will tell you. What helps them the most is giving them honest feedback. They don't want you tiptoeing around or anything else. I'm not that type of person. I get to the point. But I do have the compassion and understanding of it. And they need to trust that you're going to be honest with them. This opens a door that they want more help. And then developing the skills, all part of that is developing the skills, as I mentioned, communication. And communication was our breakdown in our family. We were not very good. So consequently, once we learned how to communicate more effectively, it made a difference. Problem solving, we learned to problem solve, but part, her, part of the process. She could give us ideas of how to help her. And looking at yourself and the practical application. If you've got any questions, you can ask me.